Amen. Wow, I'm seeing, I'm seeing some of my, my sons and daughters out there in the faith. It's so good to see you all here. I know some of my single sons and daughters were hoping that today I would preach a message on three easy steps to get a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Sorry, today is not that day. <laughs> we can talk later. There was a man uh, that opened a phone shop. And he sold phones, you know, just the usual iPhones, Android phones, because Androids are better than iPhones. Can I get a witness? Oh. Uh, uh-oh. And he had a son. And the, his son grew up kind of sitting around the phone shop, you know, playing while his dad and his mom sold phones. And the, the boy grew older until eventually he got, you know, 13 years old or so. And his dad said, all right, son, this is our family phone shop. And so now I want you to be a part of running the shop. So he began to teach him how to run the phone shop and how to sell phones and fix phones, do all the things that they did at the phone shop. And the son really enjoyed his job in the phone shop. And uh, so, you know, he would he'd welcome the customers in. And when they would leave, you know, this little boy, he would say, thank you for coming to my shop. He, it was his shop, and he loved it. Well, one day, uh, a man, a customer came in, and he held up his phone, and he was very angry, and he said, you guys sold me this phone, and it's a piece of junk, and I want to talk to the owner of this shop. Well, I need to make this right. I am not happy about this. He, and the little boy says, oh, I don't know about that. I just work here. I don't, I don't know who... <laughs> I don't know who's in charge around here. All of a sudden, the little boy didn't want to be the owner of the shop. There was a problem. He, he just wanted to, I just, I just work here. I don't, I don't know anything about this. Um, how many of you know there are two ways to think about being a Christian? Okay? The first way is to think about it as being a part of the family of God, the family of God. You can also think about it as being one of the servants of God, okay? These are both important pictures in the Bible of how we view ourselves as Christians. We're part of the family of God, and we're also the servants of God. And today, we are in this series where we're talking about missions. We're talking today about the Great Commission, which we're going to get to in just a bit. But before we can get there, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what it means to be a part of the family of God. It's very important that we begin in this place before we get to what it means to be the servants of God. Because if you don't understand what it means to be part of the family of God, you're going to end up like that little boy in the phone shop that just says, ooh, I don't, you know, I, I don't want any part of that. I don't know what's going on there when there's trouble, okay? So I want to talk about what it means to be the family of God. So first, foremost, most importantly, we are a family. When you are led by the Spirit of God, to believe in faith that Jesus died for you. When you enter into that relationship where you accept his forgiveness for your sins, you are adopted into the family of God. You are adopted in. At that point, you are now a son or a daughter of the King of Kings, the most powerful most important king in all the universe, and he adopts you into his family and says, you're my son, you're my daughter. It's amazing what he does, okay? Let me show you a couple of scriptures. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Can we put that up? Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. It says, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Okay, one more. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 and 15. 
And it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So when we are led by the Spirit of God to put our faith in the Son of God and receive forgiveness for our sins, we are adopted into the family of God. And that is who we are. We are now children of God. You understand that, right? There are a whole list of benefits that come once you become a son or a daughter of the King of Kings. Being a part of every family has benefits, it has responsibilities. There's a whole list of benefits, okay? As a child of God, your heavenly Father gives you some things. First of all, he gives you his unconditional love. The unconditional love of God. It's a free gift. You can't earn it. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father... Let me read this translation, okay. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. And then the second part, the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. But that first part, what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God? Accepting the unconditional love of God is the key. This is the very heart of what it means to be a child of God. You have to come to a place where you believe that he loves you, not because you earned it, not because you're good enough, just because he chose to love you. And it's unconditional. That means it's not based on what you do. It's a free gift. He loves you unconditionally. And all you have to do is be bold enough to receive that, to accept that. God, I I don't know what I ever did. I, clearly, I didn't earn this, but I want this. I receive your love for me. That's a benefit of being a son or a daughter of the king. Secondly, God gives us a robe of righteousness. This is an interesting verse. Isaiah 61, verse 10. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall, shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Okay? So there's this thing that happens when we become a son, when we become a daughter of the king, where he puts his robe around us. And this is powerful. It's a little bit like, I don't know if you remember the parable of the prodigal son and how this, this boy ran away from his father's home and wasted his inheritance, lived very badly, finally decides he's going to come back to the father and says, I'll just be a servant. I don't deserve to be called your son. I'll just be a servant in your house. But the father says, oh no, oh no, you won't just be a servant in my house. You're my son. Welcome home. He welcomes him back. He shows him his unconditional love. He puts his robe around his shoulders. Okay, so there's this picture of the acceptance of the Lord and how he puts a robe of righteousness over us. That son in the parable was dirty. He'd been feeding the pigs. He smelled bad. There was nothing about him that looked like he should be wearing a nice robe, the robe of the father, a robe of righteousness. He didn't deserve it, but the father said, I'm putting this around you anyway. I don't care what you look like. This is a gift from the father to the son. 
okay? So God gives us that robe of righteousness. The third benefit of being a son or a daughter of God is that he gives us the promise of eternal life. The promise of eternal life. Now, this is really interesting. This, this in, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, and this is addressed in, in the verses before. This is addressed to the sons, the children of God. It says, Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us eternal life. Okay? So, when you become a child of God, and it talks about abiding in the Son and in the Father, that means living in relationship with Him, and it says you receive the promise of eternal life. You didn't earn it. It's just a gift. It's a benefit of being a daughter of the King. It's a benefit of being a son of the King. Fourthly, your identity. Your identity. Now, a lot of people confuse their identity with their function. Your identity means who you are. Your function is about what you do. Okay? Now, don't get these confused. A lot of people, you say, who are you? And they say, oh, I'm, I'm a carpenter. I'm a salesman. Oh, I'm, a, I'm a real estate agent. No, no, no. That's what you do. Who are you? Okay? When we become sons and daughters of the King of Kings, he reveals to us our identity, which actually he gave it to us in the very beginning because he was there, the Bible says, he wove us together in our mother's womb. He's the one that built us from nothing and built us up. He knows from the very beginning who you are. And when you become adopted into the family of God, he begins to reveal to you, this is who I made you to be. This is who I made you to be. This is what I put in you. And your identity comes from being a son of the king of kings. Here we go. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is identity. This is who you are. A chosen, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people that is owned by God himself. That's your identity. That's who you are. And that comes as a gift when you become a son or a daughter of the King of Kings. Okay, the next one. Discipline. Now, this, the slide says your discipline, but it is actually just discipline. Okay, go ahead and put that one up. Number six, discipline. Okay, now this is not something we think of as a benefit. I don't like discipline. In my family, discipline is the code word for you get a spanking. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't enjoy that. All right, my kids receive discipline when they disobey. They don't enjoy that. But listen to this amazing verse. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 6. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. I remember the first time I read this verse, I thought, that's the strangest thing. What does that mean? I don't equate discipline with love, but it is. And I've learned this as I've gotten older and understand better how it works. If the father loves the son, then when the son is doing something that is harming himself, the son is harming the son, 
the father is going to discipline them and say, don't do that. It's not good. There's a discipline that comes that's motivated by love. And this verse talks about that. So actually, the discipline of the Lord is the evidence that he loves us. When, when God is really addressing something in your life and you feel like, oh, Lord, I, I, I feel convicted. Oh, this sin you're showing me. Oh, I feel so convicted. I don't like this feeling. It's the evidence that he loves you. He loves you so much that he's willing to discipline you because he's trying to make you more like him. You don't, it doesn't just happen automatically that you become like God the Father. There's a process of discipline that he takes you through. Okay? So discipline from the Lord is a gift, and it's a benefit. Uh, two more. Direct access to God the Father. Direct access. I'll give you two verses on this one. Um, there's, there's nobody in the family of God that is between me and him. There's no, there's no layer of, of, like, priesthood. You know, in the Old Testament, the people of Israel had to go to the priests and the priests would go into the tabernacle and approach God. The people couldn't go directly to God. In fact, if they tried, they got struck dead. It didn't work out real well for them, okay? There was, there was a layer in between the people and God because they were not holy. But in the New Testament, now God himself has become our priest. The Bible talks about this. Um, uh, Hebrews 4 Verses 14 to 16. I don't know if I put that one up. Yeah, okay, we do. Okay. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And then here's the, here's the point right here at the end. Verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Okay? So we now have, through Jesus, we now have direct access to the Father. We can draw near to the throne with confidence. He's not going to strike me dead. I messed up yesterday. And... and I probably deserve to be struck dead, but I can still go directly into the throne room of heaven and say, Dad, I really messed up yesterday. And he's not going to strike me dead because I have direct access to God now. It's a benefit of being a son. When my son comes to me and said, Dad, I uh, did something really dumb today, I don't, I don't get angry with him. I talk to him about it. I receive him into my presence. I don't say, get out of here. I don't want to talk to you, son. You know? No, a son is free to come into the presence of the Father in any condition, at any time. And that's a benefit of being a child of God. In Romans 8.15, which we already read, uh, it actually said at the end there, I don't know if you caught that, it says that we get to call him Abba. Father. Abba is like daddy, papa. It's a close term. Who would ever think that we can go to the God over everything and say, papa, daddy, that's close. That's direct access to the Father. It's a benefit. The last one I want to give you. He gives us a place of community and fellowship in the family of God. Community and fellowship in the family of God. Romans 8, 29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Who's the many brothers? It's us. It's us. We are the family 
of God. So all of these things are benefits of being in the family of God. And you don't earn them. They're just a gift from God. It just comes when you accept what Jesus did in faith and you enter into relationship with God, you are adopted in. Okay? However, just because we don't earn all of these things doesn't mean that there's nothing for us to do. Okay? Now, this is the key point. The truth is, we're not an ordinary family. We are a royal family. We are sons and daughters, not just of any king, of the king of kings. We are royalty. We didn't earn it, but we are. That's just what he made us. And a royal family has a responsibility. The royal family doesn't just live for themselves. The royal family lives for others, for the good of others. And so what happens is that once we understand who we are as sons and daughters of God, he invites us into a life of righteousness and service. He invites us, we put the robe of righteousness on our shoulders, but now he says, I want you to live in a way that honors that robe. I want you to actually live a clean life on the inside. Yes, I've covered over your sin, but now I want you to live clean from the inside out. That's living righteousness and service. He invites us to live a life of serving others. You can say it like this. Son is who I am. It's my identity. Son is who I am. Serving is what I do. Okay? Say that with me, would you? Just Let's just say this together. Son, if you're a woman, daughter, okay? A son or a daughter is who I am. Serving is what I do. Jesus set the example on this. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, he says, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, And then here, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So Jesus set the example for us of what we do as royal sons and daughters of the king. We have the opportunity to make a choice to live a life of service to others, looking not only to our own interests, but the interests of others as well. He set the example on this. And that is what brings us to the Great Commission. Now, this part I think you're familiar with. Most Christians have heard this before. But after Jesus died and rose again, he gave the disciples the final instructions that we call the Great Commission. We can read that in Matthew chapter 28. It's a famous verse in the church. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So our Heavenly Father says this, All right, son, daughter, now that you wear my robe. Now that you understand the identity that I've given you, now that you carry that ring of authority on my fin- your finger, that was in the parable too, the, the father gave the son the ring of authority back. And the, our heavenly father says, now that you have these things, go out into the world and tell the ones who don't know me yet about my great love for them and my invitation for them to become part of the family of God. That's what missions is about. 
Jason last week did a great job of explaining the details of how we, what it means to be a missionary and, and why we do that. And, and today I just wanted to address this big picture understanding of our motivation. Why do we go? See, the heart of evangelism is telling people the good news that the King of Kings is a good father who has invited them into his family. It's, evangelism's not about just handing out some tract or getting people to come to church. It's inviting people to join the family of God. That's what going out into all the world, of the, this, this, this great commission, um, ba- make disciples, baptizing. We're inviting them into the family of God. That's why it's good news. It's not, a, it's not supposed to be this hard, scary thing to go and share the gospel. We're inviting them to join the family. It's wonderful news. And make disciples. The heart of making disciples is teaching people what it looks like to live as a son of the king from the inside out, to live that righteous life, to live that life of service to others, and what it means to serve others by showing them the love of the Father, like Jesus himself did. So, evangelism, discipleship, it's the heart of the Great Commission. But really, it's about family. It's about the family of God and how we are part of that family. And now, once we understand who we are as sons and daughters, now we can go out into the world and invite them to join the family and invite them to learn what it means to live as sons and daughters of the King. It's a, an amazing privilege that we get to be a part of this whole process. You know, if I had time today, I would, I would tell you more. As, as servants of the king, there's a whole nother list of benefits. I don't have that time to teach that today. I'll just kind of list them off. God gives you calling. He gives you gifting. He gives you anointing. He gives you protection. He gives you honor. God actually says he honors. Uh, if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him, it says in John 12, 26. That's a surprising one. And finally, he gives you eternal reward. There's, there's a reward for being a servant of God that is above and beyond the benefits of being a son of God. Everyone gets a place at the table as a son of God. But there is special reward for those who live a faithful life of service to the Lord. He rewards that. He doesn't, he doesn't overlook that. So some people in heaven get greater rewards than others. And it's based on what they did as a son or daughter of God. That's the reality of it. So there's this whole list of benefits and things that you can access as a servant of God once you choose to step into that. This year is a a missional year for us as a church. You're going to get the opportunity to sign up and go out on missions trips. I strongly encourage you to do that. But beyond that, live every day from the perspective of being a son or a daughter of the King of Kings. And as you go out that door every day, you say, I'm not just going out this door as me, as Luke. I'm going out this door as a son of the King of Kings. Everywhere I go, everywhere I, when I meet, I'm representing the King of Kings. I want to show them his love. I want to show them what it looks like to encounter someone from the royal family. That's the privilege, that's the opportunity that we have this year is to go out into the world as sons and daughters of the King of Kings. Go on that missions trip. Go into your workplace every day. Walk around your neighborhood every opportunity. Hey, I have some amazing news for you. Tell people, did you know you have, there's a way for you to get into the royal family? There's a way for you to become a son or a daughter of the King of Kings. Did you know? That's missions. That's the heart of the church. That's what we get to do as a family. We go out and we invite others in. It's a beautiful thing. Would you stand with me now as we close? I just want to pray for us as a church.
Father, I ask that every person in this room will get a fresh revelation, a fresh understanding of what it means to be your child. Even right now, Lord, even, even just as they're sleeping tonight, a fresh download of what it means to be a child of God, a son or a daughter of the King of Kings. And I pray, God, that, that they will fully enjoy all the benefits that come with that. They couldn't earn them, but they're theirs for the taking. And I pray that they would enjoy those benefits. But God, I pray that like that little boy growing up in the phone shop, that they will decide, you know what? It's time for me to just stop playing around the shop and actually be about my father's business. It's time for me to go out and actually represent the father in this world because it's a world full of people that doesn't know. So God, I ask right now that you would begin to awaken people to their calling to be servants of the Most High God. They are a son and daughter by identity, but by function, they can be a servant that goes and represents you. Awaken people to that right now, I pray, Lord. Let them have an understanding of what that looks like in their life. I pray, Father, that you will release something in the church this year. Lord, a shift that would take place. Lord, that we would become more aware of the world around us and more aware of your perspective as the Father on the world around us and that we would represent you wherever we go. This is the Great Commission. This is our privilege. So Father, I ask that for each one of us today that are listening to this, that you would come and you would call us up. That we are growing up as your sons and daughters and we're stepping into new authority. We're stepping into new responsibility. Thank you, Father, for what it means to be your children. We thank you for the gift of relationship with you. And I pray, Lord, that, that we would live lives that honor you, that glorify you, lives of righteousness, lives of useful service in your kingdom, and that we will enjoy the rewards of that for eternity as we step into heaven and you greet each one of us with a well done my good and faithful servant, enter into your reward. Let that be each of our experience, Lord. Let that be our desire and our goal today, now, that we will live that kind of a life. I pray all these things and ask them in the name of your Son who made all of this possible. We thank you, Jesus, for what you have done to become our high priest and invite us into the family. We honor you today, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Come on. Come on. What a privilege this is. What a privilege. What a privilege. Thank you guys for your time. We went a couple minutes over. Sorry about that. I love you very much, and uh, you are dismissed. Thank you. <laughs>